The Great Russian Tale of the Triplets, Part 3. Now, I mentioned uh, the three brothers had made it home and that their parents had retired happily. Now, this particular region was ruled by a very old king. He was a widower. He had uh, no sons. He did have one daughter, Irina. And as he got on in age, his counselors constantly badgered him that he should probably marry off Irina so that he would have a male heir to take his place, lest the place, the entire kingdom, fall into uh, civil war, which seemed to happen a lot in Russia. <laughs> and other places as well. Now, the king really did not want Irina to be married, but at the insistence of his counselors, he finally said, all right, I will choose a husband, but this husband must pass certain tests. And he designed these tests assuming that no one in the world would be able to pass them. He said, test number one, I have in my stables a reindeer brought in from the north, one of the fastest creatures on earth. At the rising of the sun, I'll, I will release it. And whoever will marry my daughter must run it down and bring it back by sundown. Test number two. You will go to the north tower of my castle and there close a the door. Now this seems simple enough, except that behind that door, it changed to a wall, was a witch, a very powerful witch. And when they had chained her to the wall, they had made the mistake of making the chains a little bit too long. And anyone or anything that approached that door was at once seized and cast aside with great violence. And despite many attempts for months, that door still stood open. Test number three. If the first two tests are passed, I shall place upon my castle wall, upon the battlements, a crystal goblet, inverted, and upon its stem I shall balance an apple. The person attempting for Irina's hand must find a way to bring down this apple without leaving the ground below and without breaking the glass. And the counselors looked at each other and said, this is impossible. And the king said, that's my rules. <laughs> well, news of this reached the three brothers. And they sat around and discussed this at the table. And they realized that between them, each one of them could perform one of these tasks. But how are we going to do this? Well, they are identical triplets. <laughs> And so, if we were to get some princely robes and each one of us were to tackle one of the tasks each day, we could win the princess and then we would draw lots to see which one of us actually married her. So, after this discussion, it was decided that first step, we need uh, some suitable clothing. And the closest place to get this was the great marketplace at Kiev, which from where they were living was three days ride on a fast horse or an afternoon's run for Swiftfoot. So Swiftfoot set out for Kiev while the other two made certain preparations. And the next day he returned with a set of princely clothes. And of course he was the first to don them and he showed up at the castle gate saying, I am here to win the princess. Show me your first challenge. And so the reindeer was brought out and the king looked at, at Swiftfoot and said, tell me, where is your horse? And Swiftfoot simply shrugged and says, I have no need of a horse. I have my own tricks. And so the reindeer was released and Swiftfoot took off at, at a normal run out towards the edge of the woods where it had disappeared. But as soon as he was out of sight, he ran as only he could run. And soon he was running alongside of the reindeer. 
and at an opportune moment, he leapt, across, he leapt up on its back, seizing its horns, and of course, it bucked and jumped and wove to and fro, but at last it tired and admitted it had met its match. And so now Swiftfoot climbed down, and he took from his pocket the one thing he had prepared, which was a length of string, and he tied it to the reindeer's antlers, and he tied the other end to his wrist, and he stretched it out some distance, and sat with his back against the tree and took a nap, knowing that if the reindeer strayed too far, it would tug on his wrist and wake him. This happened two or three times, until close to the end of the day, he got up, wrapped up his string, leapt on the back of the reindeer, guided it back towards the castle. As they reached the end of the woods, he got off, seized it by the horn, and led it meekly back into the stable, much to the amazement of the king and everyone else who was watching. And he then bowed to the king and said, it has been an extremely tiring day. Uh, I believe I shall go back to my small encampment in the other direction there. I shall come back tomorrow and attempt a second challenge. So he went back and he handed the cloak to Clever Hand, the second brother. Now Clever Hand in his preparations had gone to the shop of a man who was well known for casting statues and, and all sorts of things in bronze. And for a certain amount of, of monies, uh, uh, arranged to use the man's shop for the day. He walked into the shop and the first thing he did was pick up a knife and a block of wax and he held it for a moment. And immediately he began carving. And in a very short time, he had carved an exact replica of his own right hand. <laughs> he then went and mixed up some plaster. And he encased the wax hand in plaster, leaving a small hole at the top, waited for the plastic to dry, and then went to the ovens, took out a great crucible of molten bronze, and carefully poured it into the hole. And when the wax had melted away and been replaced by the bronze, and it had finally cooled, he broke open the mold, and there was an exact duplicate of his hand, to which he attached an iron rod, perhaps half the length of, of his arm. So the next morning, when it was his turn to take on the challenge, he put the hand and a few other things into a small bag which he hid under his cloak, presented himself to the king, and said to those assembled, I shall assemble, I shall uh, ascent to the tower, and I suspect a great stroll to take place, so for your own safety, you should probably remain down here below. He went up the stairs, up to the tower, looked at the door from the end of the hall, and from his bag, he took out the bronze hand and a small brazier and some coals and some fire-making material. And he lit the brazier and fanned the coals and table air very hot. And he then took the bronze hand and he laid it in the coals, turning it from time to time until it was so hot that it was literally glowing. Then holding it by the iron rod, he made deliberately heavy footsteps down the hall, calling out to the witch, saying, Your days of freedom are ended. I am here to shut you in once and for all. And as he approached the door, he held out the glowing hand towards the door. And immediately the witch's hand came around the door to grab it and toss it away, and immediately pulled back, shrieking in pain. At that moment, clever hand threw his shoulder against the door, slamming it shut, bolting it tightly, dusted off his hands, and that was that. So he emptied out the brazier, stomped out the coals, put the hand down to cool, and while things were cooling, he ruffled his clothing considerably, 
took some of the soot and smeared it on his hands and face. Once the hand was cooled, he put it and the brazier and all of the other accoutrements back into his pouch, put it under his cloak, and came staggering down the stairs, looking very worn and, and tired and bedraggled. And he said, your, your Majesty, I have achieved your second test. But it was a long and difficult struggle. Uh, I must go back to my camp. I shall come back tomorrow for the third challenge. And the king sent men up the stairs to check, and surely enough, the door was closed and bolted. So Clever Hand went back to his camp and handed the fancy clothing over to his third brother, Keen Eye. Now, the following morning, Keen Eye, wearing the resplendent clothing, made his way to the castle. Now, in his day of preparation, he had gone to see a Fletcher, and there he had made a very special arrow. This arrow had a very thin, narrow point, such as used as, as penetrating armor. But what was unusual about it is that perhaps a hand length behind the tip of the arrow set into the shaft was a cross piece, which, pre which prevented the arrow from penetrating anywhere beyond. And slinging his bow over his shoulder, he headed off to the castle, and there on the castle grounds, there stood the king and a great uh, crowd of people waiting to see what was going to happen next. Now, Keen Eye stepped up onto the castle green and looked up at, at, at the uh, battlements, and surely enough, there sitting on the crenellation was this inverted crystal glass and sitting upon its stem was an apple, and not a very big one at that. But Cain Eye simply shrugged and unslung his bow and knocked his arrow, and giving a brief glance to the penance to judge the wind, without hesitation he drew back and left fly. The arrow sped truly to the target, penetrated through the apple, but when it hit the cross piece, Instead of penetrating all the way through, it lifted the apple and sent it sailing over the wall into the courtyard beyond. The glass itself barely moved. And now Keen Eye slung his bow, walked through the castle gate, followed by the king and his entire retinue, glanced about, looked for the arrow, walked over, picked it up, brought it back, knelt before the king, and held it up saying, Your Majesty, this is the third and final test that I have passed. Do you agree? The glass is unbroken. I give you your apple. And as you yourself have seen, my feet have never left the ground. Well, the king reluctantly had to agree that uh, all three of his challenges had been met and said, this coming Sunday, after morning mass, you and Arena shall be married. So, Kenai returned to their camp, and as they agreed, they drew lots to see which one of them would actually marry the princess. As it turned out, it was clever hand that the fates smiled upon that day. And so, the following Sunday, he and the Princess Arena were indeed married. It seems that the fates had chosen quite well, for Clever Hand found that Arena was not only beautiful, but also quite clever in her own right, and quite uh, productive. Arena, on the other hand, became very fond of Clever Hand, for not only was he strong and handsome, but you must remember that with this particular brother, whatever tool he held in his hand, he at once became master of his usage. <laughs> and Irene saw to it that he held the tool in his hand as often as was practicable. Now this is almost the end of the story. However, it was not yet a year before the old king finally died. And 
clever hand was raised up to be the new king. Upon reaching the throne, one of his first orders was to summon his two brothers to the court. And there he appointed each of them to high station and also arranged for each of them to be married to one of the other ladies of the court. And thus it was that the three of them lived happily and raised their families and ruled the kingdom together for many, many years. And that, finally, is the end of the great Russian story of the triplets.